what is uh, the fascist welfare state, so the Italian fascist welfare state, uh, which in some ways is a kind of primitive foreshadowing of what the welfare state then becomes. It's not that fascism is something toward which we are moving. Um, it's a much more limited model of uh, social and economic control of labor seas. Mussolini is a dabbler, an economic dabbler, who basically pays off interest, uh, economic interest in this country. The way Obama is doing right now, he did it on a much more modest scale. Uh, and people ran around in uniforms and sang songs, and very interesting iconography. Uh, but the welfare state, aside from a certain kind of rhetoric um, about the workers and the, the owners of the industry all being part of the Italian nation, uh, as seen in the Ducato del Lavoro, uh, which uh, comes out in the 1990s, um, does not really go very far in terms of economic redistribution. And in many ways, the Italian fascism, uh, I think, illustrates Aristotle's notion that um, uh, the uh, uh, fascism is a counter-revolutionary imitation of the left. I don't think it really advances it. Right? The, uh, the Nazi model, of course, is much more vicious, brutal, and nihilistic. But economically, aside from uh, spropriating Jews and engaging in various terrorist acts, they don't change the economy of the country very decisively. Um, and uh, the communists, of course, do, um, but there is a relatively short life experiment, except for Russians. Um, and uh, in Eastern Europe, they simply represent a garrison state imposed by the Soviet occupation, which then proceeds to uh, brutalize the population carry out various uh, social experiments, uh, which simply increases poverty. But, but all of this will end with the removal of the Soviet armies. Um, what becomes the winning model uh, among these competing, uh, uh, competing models of uh, uh, welfare state government becomes something like the Swedish, modest, the Swedish social democracy as modified by Anglo-American uh, democratic institutions. Um, and this really has to do with the, the victory of the United States. Uh, the victory in the Second World War, America becomes the, uh, the archetypal, prototypical democracy. And uh, it stands for freedom and democracy against the Soviet Empire. Um, and it also, in a sense, stands for capitalism of a very strange kind. I, I'm always amused when I read French Marxists denouncing French communism uh, in a society with a very large welfare state. Uh, and in a society in which the, uh, the airline and other industries were all to the state. Uh, but yet this represents the most, uh, the most vicious form of Manchestrian liberalism uh, for the, the Marxist and the socialist left. Um, the reality, of course, is you, have, you, you do not have examples of those fair capitalism countries, what they represent, these Western capitalist democracies, uh, is a kind of halfway house. Uh, they are partly socialist, they are partly capitalist. Um, they are partly liberal in the 19th century settings, since they usually have some constitutional documents, certainly in the case of the Americans, going back to the late 18th century. And the British have an unwritten constitution, at least theoretically going back to, I don't know, label for some ancient uh, figures. Uh, the reality, of course, is that all of them move in a particular direction, which is toward egalitarian democracy, bureaucratic control, and something looking like socialism but never quite becoming socialism. Okay. And uh, this becomes the victorious welfare state model. Um, and another, um, uh, one of the points that I think needs to be emphasize is that the reason this model wins is because the other models of welfare state lose the Soviet model, the communist model, which is a kind of non-starter, and the fascist model, uh, which is a kind of counter-revolutionary imitation of the right, and the Nazi model, which leads to world disaster. So the, by, by default, the American model wins, which is really a, the, the Anglo-American model, is the British have pretty much the same model, it's a little more advanced than the world of socialism. Um, 
Um, and uh, this is modified by, uh, by vestiges in the old liberal heritage um, and by some continued uh, homage being paid to the free market, particularly when your enemy is a communist person, you know, uh, totalitarian socialism. It becomes necessary, even if you're building a large democratic welfare state, to speak of yourself as the defenders of capitalism engaged in a worldwide struggle uh, against socialism or socialist communism. Uh, for those of the East, West German and East German governments, uh, you're looking at, at one, one is a social democratic government and the other is a Soviet socialist government. Uh, to say that one represents socialism and the other represents capitalism uh, is an a misleading overstatement. But this is what one typically heard throughout the period of the Cold War. Um, another important factor in understanding what the welfare state becomes um, is to look at uh, what I call the Malazian model uh, of the interwar period. And it's something I think to which David Farron, uh, without even mentioning it, was sort of, was sort of alluding. Um, the, the belief that somehow all people, I think certainly Hans mentioned this in his humorous remarks this morning, that all people are really the same, they're all interchangeable. Uh, there are no ethnic, cultural, gender differences, and all people can be equally socialized uh, by an inevitable, uh, presumably all-powerful state, the one which they will vote. Uh, and then at some point in the future, they'll all become the same. Um, and uh, part of this is the rejection, the emphatic rejection of genetics, heredity, and human behavior. Now, I, for one, do not believe that this is the result of Nazism. I think, in fact, that this, this may have an intensified tendency, but it goes back into the interwar period. And uh, uh, in the interwar period, you have schools of anthropology, sociology developed. You must see the United States, places like Columbia and Johns Hopkins, uh, which will make an argument against any kind of hereditarian influence in the behavior. Uh, and it will also push the argument that the state can socialize people in such a way um, as to make them all perform at pretty much the same level. Uh, and the only reason they're not performed at the same level is because of discrimination or unfair economic privilege, conditions that the government should be able to remove within a relatively short period of time. And it will do it democratically. And it'll be democratic, A, because everybody will vote for it, you know, particularly if they're conditioned by public educators, they might need it, but they'll all vote for it, so it'll be democratic. And the other thing is we'll make people more equal, and equality is the essence of democracy, right? And that everyone is to be equal. Uh, as the Greeks would say, homo, uh, homo iote, so equality, that this is the, the necessary foundation of a democratic order. Um, and once you uh, bring the second uh, notion into the mix, the uh, uh, universal egalitarianism, uh, the notion of environmentalist control, um, it, that the welfare state then will become emboldened to try things that go well beyond uh, simply redistributing money, or providing everybody with great to brave uh, Security, uh, it, it now gets into the business of socializing people. Uh, and here, of course, we come to the, uh, the war against the non existent demon, fascism. Uh, by now, fascism can mean everything from not treating, uh, uh, not treating hobos who smell a body odor and people who seem uh, uh, discriminating against X group or Y group, although not against Germans. That's, you know, it's a very diversion act and uh, it's a genetically infected. But, but other groups, you know, other groups are all being treated equally. And uh, we're, but this is, uh, but at the same time, we are to try to rid the dominant group, who are, I suppose, white, male, Western, Christian, uh, of any uh, vestiges of, um, uh, any vestiges of past discrimination or attitudes that might lead them to treat people unequally. Uh, because any sign of inequality will lead inevitably to second outcomes. I mean, this will go from one to the other. It's, it's, it's a very easy, it's a very easy movement. 
or uh, uh, any unwillingness to accept unlimited numbers of political immigrants who will then be re-educated by the state and be given affirmative action shows a, an inclination toward fascism, uh, which itself can, could lead to another Holocaust. So as long as you keep people aware of these problems, uh, they're, it's very, it should be very, and as long as they are, they are inculcated in certain attitudes through public education, uh, through the media, uh, it would be possible to go on socializing that. Uh, so I, I think what happens, once you introduce this element of re-socialization and anti-fascism, uh, is that the welfare state becomes much more um, aggressive uh, and all-encompassing um, in its mission uh, than it had been before. Uh, this is sort of the, the second stage. Now, sort of looking back at it, you know, one of the questions that I sort of asked myself in retrospect, is it possible for the welfare state to develop differently? Um, didn't necessarily have to go in this multicultural anti-fascist direction. Um, and what I say is there are, you know, there are counterfactual, uh, counterfactuals I can come up with. You know, they can say, well, uh, you could have remained something like an Irish Catholic uh, state in Ireland, or clerical fascism, or a Polish nationalist state, or something like that. Um, but this could only exist, one might say, within very, very small groups, relatively small groups. It would certainly not work in a, what is really a kind of multinational nation state, an American like nation state, but a, uh, a multinational empire. You cannot push something like this. Uh, because you're dealing with, so it raises such a diverse population uh, and such diverse cultures that it's almost impossible to impose these more colloquial versions of the welfare state that are limited by religion, nationality, and so forth. Uh, and in this respect, America gets a model, right? Because the United States is, uh, here is, you know, our neoconservatives, it's a global democracy. We are global in two senses. One, we try to absorb everybody, and, you know, and the other thing is if we're successful, we'll be able to make the rest of the world look like New York City. Just kind of moving our armies and you know, moving our media from one place to the next. So, so this, in a sense, becomes the uh, sort of the American, the, the, the American model. I mean, it's, it's global. It's a global welfare state. Um, it also has a global mission because it cannot tolerate uh, human inequalities anywhere else. We have to go to Iraq to make sure that they have women's rights, so they live in a secular state, and they you know, become like Americans. Um, but I, I, the notion that somehow democracies never fight each other, of course, overlooks the inconvenient fact that they sometimes fight brutal wars, more brutal than other societies. Uh, but also that the notion of global democracy is an invitation to continue imperialism. Uh, you know, it's, just the, it's not that, you know, it's once you are saved, you save the rest of the world, because, you know, the uh, other the Europeans may be content to, you know, fight fascism in their own countries. Americans insist on fighting the same demons all over the world, uh, or did until very recently, uh, and sometimes they've done it very brutally. So the, the, well, the, the democratic welfare state not only, when I say, is concerned with re-socialization of its, its own population, or socialization of its population, re-socialization of encoding for the old folks like me, for the young folks that will be socialized once. Uh, but it also is interested in reaching out to other parts of the world and to bringing them into the uh, community of the being. Um, now, and there's also, I think, a kind of myth that deserves to be explored that America and countries like it represent the use of the words of Irving Crystal in one of his uh, uh, many editorials for the Wall Street Journal. America is a democratic, capitalist, welfare state. Um, this is almost like describing a country as a Nazi, communist, libertarian government. <laughs> so, so. I mean, it contains all kinds of problematic terms in it that I'm not quite aware that, uh, uh, that we could have to sort of unpack. Um, democratic states do not remain capital states forever because the tendency of democracy is for greater equality and for the, for the majority of the population voting to redistribute. Uh, income uh, and where it seems unfair economic advantages 
um, uh, the, the welfare state uh, at some point uh, is going to start to eat into the capitalism. Uh, and uh, you know, I think there's a majority of, a majority of the Germans that it's going to go so the majority of the Americans that it's going to go so It is in many ways the logical outcome or the culminating point of a democratic welfare period. Um, and I think we see it, we have seen for a very long time, is a kind of precarious coexistence uh, of um, uh, qualities or attributes that are not necessarily going to coexist forever. And I, I think Dr. Wilfred Friedman, towards the end of his life, said democracies don't work very well if you wish a free economy. Um, I suppose Singapore would be better. Uh, it would. Uh, you're in a free economy, and it's a fairly controlled society, and it's not very democratic. Uh, but when the people get to vote, they will vote to discreet income, and particularly when public education and when other institutions that coexist with our democracy uh, push them in the same direction. Um, the pr problem is once you have uh, made this wager with the devil, so to speak, once you ask the government to start redistributing people's income, and to deal with economic and social inequalities, you have empowered the state to do other things as well. You know, and if you look at the United States today, I think economic freedom is probably more secure than other forms of freedom. Uh, I think freedom of expression, freedom of opinion, is probably in worse state than economic freedom. Um, there, 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 there used to be, when I was a kid, it was widely believed that one could have um, this is a typical liberal argument, probably Bob H. knows this too, that you know, we, we believe in verbal or intellectual freedom, we just want to distribute the property. Well, it has sort of reached a point where they, you know, they're redistributing property, income, all kinds of other things, but this seems to be less of a problem than the thought control. Um, and I, I think this is really part of the, it's not just the quantity, it's the quality in the welfare state. As it becomes more and more interested in socialization, um, uh, without necessarily abandoning economic redistribution, um, what is going to suffer even more than economic freedom will be thought in the thought. And uh, I, I think the United States, for those who say this is the case, I think that the United States is on the same path that Europe is moving on right now. And I suspect that in 10 years' time, we may in some ways become indistinguishable. Um, I would like to believe that well, the only thing that's possible is that the government may move to accept this way and there will be some kind of backlash for which I hope, uh, for which I pray. Uh, this, this, may, this may in fact happen and it may be so, you know, the government is so catastrophic, the effect will be, uh, will be overwhelming. And uh, that is what I hope it is. The, 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 the other, more likely outcome, uh, and, uh, you know, if you're a betting man, you can bet an outcome number two, uh, is it will become more like Europe. There will be more thought control, more political correctness, more thought police, uh, uh, hate speech laws. Uh, together, we can do more economic institution. Now, I really hate to leave you with this, um, these unhappy thoughts. Um, therefore, I would like to see, you know, perhaps focus on outcome number one. Uh, in which the, uh, the people do rise up, the American people do rise up and react against this before it's too late. Um, and but, but the, uh, the point of it, as long as so much of the socializing process is left in the hands of the state, and the state is assisted by the media, which has become uh, uh, what I call priesthood and manager of the state, uh, it is very, very hard to reverse these trends. And uh, uh, another problem which I think one faces is that political parties become simply accessories to the manager of the state. Right? All ideology becomes, in a sense, a, a function of getting favors to the manager of the state. So the Republican Party of the United States engages in as much redistribution as Democrats. Um, uh, they do this pretty much the same things. They just tell you to get a government off your back, the government says government is good. They do the same thing. See, the Christian Democrats in Germany are like the Social Democrats, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, it's another socialist party. Uh, the political parties have become, have become useless vehicles of change. 
and therefore it has to look for some possibility outside of the parliamentary system or the party system. Uh, there are referenda in the United States, which do not exist that in Germany. Uh, uh, people can occasionally vote down bad things. The problem is the same people will then turn around and vote for the political parties that do all the bad things that they vote against. Um, and then their kids are going to be brainwashed by the public educators uh, and by the media, the parents and the kids by the media. Uh, so what, what, whatever happens or <coughs> could happen to bring about a change has to be so catastrophic, so apocalyptic that I can barely imagine what it would be. Um, but you know, I, I, th I think the system is very much in place. And uh, perhaps the, the, you know, looking retrospectively, Providing a retrospect as to how we got here, uh, I suppose, is uh, almost the act of a pathologist looking at terminally ill patient. 